Amen. Thank you, Angie. Appreciate that. Appreciate that greatly. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, every service this month, being as it, being as it is our month of missions, um, we'll be preaching on the Great Commission. And uh, last week, we talked about why missions matter. We talked about why we bother, why we go out, why we do what we do. And today, what we want to do is we want to kind of begin a little basic outline on this passage of Scripture. And in this passage, what we want to find is, number one, God gives us a mandate to go. All right. Number two, that He gives us a message, and the message is to be taught to all nations. And then He tells us that there is a means in going, and we'll talk about that in verses 19 through 20. But today, we want to focus on that mandate and the mandate is that we have a responsibility to go into all the world, not just to the parts of the world we enjoy, not just to the vacation spots, not just to the places we're familiar with, but we are to go to all parts. And by the way, this mandate is a command. God didn't just suggest that we go. He didn't just think it was a good option. Um, he tells us, to go. It's a command. And he says this, and I'm just going to read three words in Matthew 28, 19. Go ye, therefore. Go ye, therefore. The ye, by the way, tells us that it's everybody. All of us need to be going in some way, some form or fashion. By the way, that going could be going to your next door neighbor. It could be going to the person you work next to. It could be going to another part of the world. It could be going to somewhere within the United States. It might be somewhere here in Ohio, even right here in Fairfield. But the idea is we have a responsibility to go and tell others about Jesus Christ. You know, when we think about following God's commands, uh, the very first thing that most people would think about, if I said, do you follow God's commandments? The very first thing that's going to come to your mind is probably the Ten Commandments. You know, do I do this? Do I do that? And, and you look at all the things that he says to do, or not to do, rather. And we look at that, and that seems like the first thing that comes to our mind. But what we forget and what we need to be thinking about is God gave us also some commands that we need to be doing. Not just things that we ought not to do, but things that we should do. In Scripture, we're commanded, for example, to study God's Word. That means if I'm not studying God's Word, I've committed as great a sin as I would have if I'd have lied to someone. And we need to understand that the Bible says we need to pray. If I'm not praying, I've committed as great a sin as if I had committed adultery. And not only that, but we're told to be thankful. We're told to love one another. And here we're commanded to go and tell others about Jesus Christ and His saving grace. You know, it's interesting because as much as we fear breaking the commands of God, we should also fear breaking these commands of God as well. Do you find it interesting? If you were going to gossip about somebody, you would probably say, did you see where somebody was the other night? Did you see what they were doing? Did you hear about what they were doing? Did you hear the words that came out of their mouth? Can you believe they told that joke? Can you believe that they would be caught in a place like that? Can you believe the lies that they told me? We would talk about gossip and we would gossip about someone in regard to things that they have done that they shouldn't do. And more often than not, we seem to be compelled to pay attention to that. But has anybody ever come to you and gossiped about, did you see who was not on visitation? Did you see who was not praying? Did you see who was not studying their Bible? You know, that's not, just, that's not the juicy gossip, is it? That's not the things we want to gossip about. But the fact is, we have a command to do those things every bit as much as we have a command not to do the others. So when we look at this picture, I want to take a look at the idea that, listen, God gave us these things that we might be able to accomplish His will and to do what He tells us to do. So it's a command of God. And so when we look at this, we need to have as much fear in our hearts and in our lives about breaking these commands of God as we would any other command. Um, let me share with you a, a, a story. I knew a man, uh, a friend of mine, just a little bit older than me actually, 
And uh, he had believed, or he shared this with me about a year ago. He said, I believe when I was a very young man, God called me into the ministry. He said, I really believe it with all my heart. He said, I believed it so greatly then that I began taking Bible classes. And uh, it was a, there was a church, and he was taking Bible classes within this church. It was kind of like an institute. And he was going to start there and then move up from there. And so he started taking Bible classes and started praying about how God might have him to serve. He started becoming more active in his home church so that he might prepare himself to take a leadership role at some point when God so desired for him to do so. And so he was preparing for that. Well, in the midst of all of this, he and his wife, he was married, he and his wife began to have some children and his job began to demand a lot more time of him. He began to be promoted, and along with the promotion, he began to receive some pretty healthy paychecks, and, and, uh, and he kind of went into a little more debt than he expected. He bought a new home, bought cars, and all those kinds of things, and before you know it, he stopped taking the Bible classes. Before you know it, he kind of let those things go by the wayside. He never forgot that God had dealt with his life. He still believed God had called him into ministry, but he had pushed it aside. About a year ago, and like I said, he's older than me. I'm 66, so he was, I don't know how much older, but a couple of years at least. And he was telling me, he says, you know, he says, I've got a lot of regrets in my life, but the greatest regret, he says, when I look back over my life, he says, listen, I have a loving wife. I've got great children. Uh, I have a lot of nice things in this world. He says, but I just can't get past the fact that I know I was disobedient to God because I did not do what he called me to do. And he says, I have lived my life without that peace. I've lived my life miserable because I was not obedient to God to do what God had called me to do. I would not want to live like that. But we have a command to go. And if God deals with us specifically and personally, we definitely need to be going. The Apostle Paul was on his way to becoming the darling of the Pharisees. I mean, he was one of those guys that he was, and the Pharisees, by the way, was the most affluent Jewish sect, and, um, and he was on his way to becoming the leader of that. I mean, they, he was their guy. He had a silver spoon in his mouth, if you would. He was the guy they were putting all their stock in, and on his way to Damascus, he was traveling to Damascus for the purpose of putting Christians in jail, persecuting them, and things such as that. And on the way, God met him and dealt with his life in such a way that would change him for an eternity. And in a nutshell, the crux of what God told him to do was, listen, I need you to go and tell the Gentile world about Jesus Christ. Now, while on the road, he was simply told to listen, go into Damascus. A fellow by the name of Ananias is going to deal with you there. He says in Acts 9, 6, He trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told what thou must do. All right? And then he meets Ananias there, and it's interesting because God tells Ananias to look for Paul. And then in Acts 9, 15, God gives Ananias a message that he is to share with Paul. And he says uh, in Acts 9, 15, this is Ananias, uh, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So in this whole process, I want you to stop and think about it for a minute. Paul's on the Damascus road, and God stops him and says, Go see Ananias. Go. He deals then with Ananias and said, Ananias, I'm going to send a guy to you by the name of Paul. Um, you need to go search him out. Go. Ananias has got to be obedient. Paul's got to be obedient. They get together and Ananias says, the Lord told me to tell you, you need to go and preach to the Gentiles. So here's the picture. In all of this picture, it was a matter of saying, listen, when God says go, we go. Whether it's Paul heading to Damascus, whether it's Ananias searching out Paul, whether it's Paul going to the Gentiles, the idea is when God says go, we need to go. And by the way, we have a direct command, a mandate, if you would, from God himself that we, it says that we have a responsibility to go to every person in all this world and tell them about Jesus Christ. You know, if a preacher is commanded to go pastor, nothing should stand in his way. If a missionary is commanded to go to a foreign country, nothing should stand in his way. If a church planter is commanded to plant a church, nothing should stand in the way. The command to go should never be ignored. Again, we look in Scripture, we say, the Bible tells me not to lie, I'm not going to lie. 
Bible tells me not to commit adultery. I'm not going to commit adultery. The Bible says not to covet. I'm not going to covet. And so when we look at these things and we begin to walk through all of those, we need to also say, God said to go. That means I need to go. I need to do what God has called me to do. So in our text, the command to go isn't just, listen, go out there randomly. He says, go for the purpose of reaching people. Teach them, disciple them. Let them know about Jesus Christ. We're to share Christ, see them baptized, disciple them, so that they then might do the exact same thing. By the way, let me say this. I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. We are not commanded to grow churches. We're not. In fact, what we're told is that Jesus Christ will build his church. We're also told that he will give the increase. We are simply to be faithful in telling others about Jesus Christ and let God do what he does with it. I think much of the concept in churches today is we've got this idea that it's our job to grow churches. And so we reach out into the world and find all the worldly things we can do in order to increase our attendance. Our job is to tell people about Jesus Christ, see them saved, so that God can then use them and bring them into the church. And then God can build his church so that he can give the increase. By the way, we're also not salespeople, which means, you know, a lot of times we go out and we're told, win the lost, win the lost. I got to I got to tell you if the lost are won by me they are not saved. I have a responsibility to tell people about Jesus Christ and God will convict their heart. God will deal with their heart so that they might be saved. Just my job to go tell them. I am not a salesman. And too many people try to turn what we do into a sales job and the problem is is then we get all scared to do it because we might fail. We might not be successful. We might not have people come to know Jesus Christ under our ministry. You know what? Your job has never been to be a salesman. Your job is just simply to go and share the gospel of Jesus Christ and let God do with it what he may. It's the job. Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without without a preacher? Our job's to tell them. Our job's to tell them. And by the way... That was the most enlightening thing that was ever told me in my entire life. And I'll tell you why. It's because it just took the pressure right off. My job is to tell them, listen, this is what God did for me. We're sinners in need of a Savior. Here's the Savior. Let me introduce him to you. Let me tell you that the only hope you have is in Jesus Christ. And let God do the work. Let God deal with their heart. They don't want to hear it. They want to reject it. That's on them. My job is to do what God has called me to do and to be faithful in doing it. We need to be obedient to his will. Second thing I want you to see is this, not only are we to go, but we're to go by the authority of God. Now, we talked about this some last week, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it, but understand that this is a command for the church. This is a command for you and I, and and realize that it's not a command by man It's not a command by an angel. It's not a command even by the church. It is not a command from me. It is a command from God himself to go out and tell people about Jesus Christ. A direct command from God. It wasn't handed down the chain. It's directly from God. Now, there are many who believe their commands come from other sources, just so you know. For example, there are those out there that believe that there are some uh, types of organizations that can command. I know the Jehovah's Witnesses, they get their commands from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And so they believe that, listen, it, it, it doesn't matter about the Bible, it's what the Watchtower tells me. Well, I got news for you, it's about what the Bible tells us. If we know Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we get our commands from that. There are others that believe in creeds. Some say, well, we have these creeds that we have to follow. I don't have no creed to follow. I have God's word. And I want to do what God has called me to do. There are some that believe individuals. They believe in the infallibility of people, whether it's the Pope, whether it's some other religious leader. But the idea is, listen, no body, no person can tell me what to do. It is God's word. I am at his beck and call. He is the one that says go, and so I want to follow his command. And nobody but nobody but nobody can alter that. Our commands are to come directly from God. Some say, well, it's just whatever leads me. It's my conscience. It's whatever I think I ought to do and what I feel comfortable doing. I don't find that in Scripture. In fact, he tells us not to follow our heart. 
we follow the Word of God. I've been told that I don't have the right to tell others that they should or should not believe. But the fact is, the command to go and tell others comes by the authority of God, and I have no other choice but to go. There's a lot of other things I could have done other than pastor, but I don't think I could have been at peace with it because I knew without a shadow of a doubt this is God's call on my life. Paul, in writing to the church in Rome, kind of says that. He begins to let them know where he gets his authority. He says in Romans 1.1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. He said, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, called me to be an apostle, and he called me to be separated unto the gospel of God so that I might preach and teach the gospel. That's what he called me to do, and so I have to do it. I also find it interesting that when he went to Damascus, he did so with the authority of chief priests. The Pharisees said, we're sending you there to go persecute others. So he went at that time under their authority. On the Damascus Road, their authority was superseded by God's authority. And when God's authority came along, his authority was greater than theirs. He says that, whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, and then we find that God altered those plans. God changed those plans you know, all of this is to say that, listen, we go by the authority of God. If you have any other plans, they are superseded by the authority of God. When God says go, you go. I remember as a child, I am sitting in front of the TV, and uh, my mom came in. She needed me to run an errand for her. And I was watching TV, and mom comes in and says, hey, I need this, and I need you to go do this. Well, wait a minute. This will be off in just a few minutes. Mom's like, Seriously? Uh, that, that's not as important as I am. What was going to be off in a few minutes was off for about a week. Yeah. And my backside got a little warmed. And I went and did what she said to do because her authority was greater than what I wanted. And so understand and know that, listen, God's authority is great. And we need to understand that when he tells us to do something, we ought to do it. And the command is clear that we are to go and tell others about Jesus Christ. We have that. You know, I heard my dad use an illustration one time when he was preaching. And I've always just kind of remembered this. He talked about when he was in the army. And he said, if your sergeant issued you a command, you didn't have a choice but to follow it. He said, in the army, he said, the first time I didn't follow a command, it just meant extra push-ups or maybe run some extra miles. Second time put me on KP duty. The third time would put you in the brig. And he said, I got news for you. You really didn't want to get on the sergeant's bad side. He said, when there was a command to go, you went. If there was a command to do, you did. And he said, the reason for that is because when you get into battle, it could mean lost lives. They tell you to do something, you delay. Tell you to do something, you refuse. It could mean somebody's life would be lost. Makes you stop and think for a moment how many lives could be lost because we failed to follow God's command. People that God intended for us to reach. People we in, that God intended for us to tell about Jesus Christ and we chose to do otherwise. God placed us right next to him on the floor of your work so that you could share Christ and you never share it. What do we know? Maybe it's that neighbor that just moved in and it's your duty to tell them about Jesus Christ and we failed to do it. It may be that a lot of, lost, a lot of folks die lost without knowing Jesus Christ because we're not comfortable going as God has said to go. The last thing I want you to see is this. Going glorifies God. It glorifies God. Now, I've shared this so many times, but the motive behind what we do is far important, more important than what we do. It is important to do things with the right motive. Why do I do this? Do I do it because it's what I enjoy? Do I do it because, you know, I think maybe I'll get something out of it. Maybe there'll be some great rewards. But the greatest motive in telling others about Jesus Christ is that it glorifies God. That ought to be our motive. Listen, we serve a God that's worthy. We serve a God that is holy above all else. We serve a God that is gracious above all else. We serve a God that is more merciful than any. We serve a God that will love us and care for us, but he is also just. And so when we look at all of this, we understand that, listen, my greatest motive ought to be because I serve a God that's worthy of worship. And I ought to want to glorify him. 
You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, and verse 16, He says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Now, if we stop there, we can kind of rear back and boast a little bit. But it doesn't stop there. And glorify your Father, which is in heaven. You see, when people see that we love the Lord enough to, to sacrifice our time, to give up whatever it is we give up, to do whatever it is we do, when people see that in our life, they see that we serve a God that ought to be glorified. They see in us something that says their God is a great God. And God is glorified in what we do. You know, often as a kid, my parents would, would sometimes, in order to get me to do something, if you'll clean your room, I'll let you go to the store and get a pop and tater chips. By the way, when I was growing up, pop and tater chips was everything. You lived and breathed for pop and tater chips, just so you know. All right. And, and, and we seem to be driven sometimes by the motivation of what can I gain by all of this. But what we need to do is change that thought. Change who we are. The Bible says that we are to change. We're a new creature in Jesus Christ. Old things have passed away. All things become new. And uh, you hear Paul talk about uh, the inner struggle that he has there in Romans chapter 7. We get all of that, but the obedience to God and why we do what we do ought to always be to glorify Him because He's worthy. Psalm, 1, uh, Psalm 18 and verse 3, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. I call upon Him because He's worthy to be praised. All that we do is because we serve a God that's worthy to be praised. Now, don't get me wrong. There are rewards. He does reward us. But the greater motivation ought to be because he's worthy of praise. You know, oftentimes we'll seek scripture. Uh, we'll see in scripture, I'm sorry. Uh, God use a term called for his name's sake. 30 times in scripture, by the way, we see him use that, that term for his name's sake. And you stop and think about it. What he's saying is, listen, his name is a great name. His name is above all other names. Man, he has a name that is so worthy of worship, above all else. And so when we look at this, we are to glorify him because of who he is, by his very namesake. That means his name is going to be glorified above every other, every other name. That just the very name should be something that we revere. You know, in the Old Testament, when they would... Uh, copy scripture. Uh, this is what I'm told, but when the scribes would copy scripture, when they would get to a place where they were copying the name of God in any form or fashion, if they were copying his name, they would stop before they did. They went and they bathed and they prayed and they put on clean clothes and, and they presented themselves wholly before God as best as they could and they would come back then and they would pin the name of God because they so revered the name of God because they so revered his name Lord, because they lifted it up above all else, because they knew how great their God was. The question is, is God glorified in what we do? So today, we understand the command is to go. We get that by going, we're serving God and we're doing what God has called us to do, but most of all, we glorify him when we go. If a missionary sets out to another country, they do so in such a fashion that glorifies God. If we have a church planter that sets out to plant a church just down the road, should do so to glorify God. If I go out on door-to-door -door visitation on Saturday morning at 1030, by the way, just to put a bug in your ear, it's to glorify God. It's not, as many would think, it's not to see whether or not people are going to be saved. I would hope that some do. It's not to get more people in the church, although I would hope that it would result in that. It is not so that people can look at me and say, boy, what a great guy he is. It is to glorify God. God said to go, and I have a responsibility to go, and I cannot glorify him if I refuse to go. Go. That's the command. So to the believer, God says go. Tell others about Jesus Christ. To the unbeliever, to those who have not trusted Jesus Christ, do you know that he is holy God above all else? 
Do you know that he loves you and he cares for you more than anyone else? So much so he sent his only begotten son to the cross to die for your sins, to resurrect that you might have eternal life, that you might escape hell and gain eternal life. Come to him. Trust him. And then go and tell others what he can do in your life. Bow your heads with me if you would today. You know, today as we we take a look at what God has told us to do. We need to really get a grip on this. Know that it's a command of God. This is not up for grabs. It's not an option. It's not, you know, I'll, I'll do it if I feel like doing it. It's a command. It's time to do what God has said to do so that God can do great and marvelous things in our midst. I wonder how many people miss out on heaven because we've failed to tell them about Jesus Christ. Folks, we have that responsibility. It's our job. Go ye, therefore. We have that job. Bow with me, if you would. Dear Father, I thank you and I praise you. You're such a great God. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here today who does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I hope and I pray that they recognize and know the sacrifice you made in sending your only begotten Son that they might have eternal life. And I pray, Father, that today that they by faith might trust you and trust the fact that he died for their sins and paid the penalty. Lord God, I pray. God, I pray that to those of us who know you as our Lord and Savior, that we'll not hesitate, that we'll not fail to go and tell others about Jesus Christ. Lord God, please, impress upon our hearts how important it is. And Lord God, may we do so that we might glorify you and lift your name above, up above all others. The name of Jesus Christ. Lord God, I pray that we'll go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please stand with us if you would.